Today we're going to be looking at securing the local area network. Think about this lovely seven layer model. If I can compromise you and your systems at layer two, then that, that's a leverage I can get to all the other layers. I can get to your IP, transport, and your applications all from the ground up. We can have a CAM table. Content Addressable Memory is the acronym for the memory of a switch where MAC addresses live. The CAM table is the memory of all the MAC addresses. VLAN attacks, DHCP attacks, MAC address spoofing attacks, address resolution attacks, and spanning tree protocol attacks. These are classic layer two attacks that are super easy to mitigate, but you have to, you have to do it. You have to turn on the commands to protect yourself from these type of attacks. So let's look at them in turn. Here we have four PCs plugged into a simple switch. Now this switch has a memory table called the content addressable memory. This is quite simply a list that says this interface has this MAC address on this VLAN. That's it. Super duper simple. So every time these four PCs talk, the switch learns based on the source MAC address where they are. So PC1, sorry, PC A is on port one, PC B is on port two, and it learns their MAC address based on what they've got to say. So it says, aha, uh -huh, I know where you are. Now the CAM table has a fixed amount of size. So if you go down to your local Harvey Norman and buy yourself a nice little D-Link switch, or a cheap switch like that, it might only have a CAM table of 1024, which means it can only learn and remember 1024 MAC addresses. Most of the switches you'll be using in NetLab or in the classrooms have a CAM table of 8,000, so they can learn 8,000 MAC addresses. Big enterprise switches, 256,000 and higher. The reason why this is important is because we're gonna look at ways of filling the CAM table to completely cripple your switch. So the amount of MAC addresses you're allowed to learn is important. Switches have rules. They learn based on the source MAC address. When they know who you are, they will only send that frame to that one person. But if they don't know where you are, if a switch has a frame and it does not know where the MAC address is meant to go to, it must forward it out every single interface except the one it came in on. Just like a broadcast, except it's not a broadcast, it's a unicast. So I'm Mr. Naughty Person. I send a hundred million frames all with a unique MAC address. So therefore the switch memory fills up it's now unable to learn new MAC addresses. So when server two tries to have a private conversation with server four, the switch is not, no longer able to learn those MAC addresses. So it has to follow rule three. When, it tries to, when server two tries to talk to server four, that frame is broadcast or copied and sent out every single interface, including interface 25, which is where Mr. Naughty Person lives. So now Mr. Naughty Person has basically turned our switch into a hub. So when server two and server four are tr desperately trying to have a private conversation, that conversation is no longer private because all of their frames are copied and broadcast out every single interface. And therefore Mr. Naughty Person can now listen in on all that private traffic. Now we need to think about different ways and different tools we have at our disposal for stopping filling up the CAM table, that very simple attack. MAC address table is a command. We have aging time, secure, and static. So what we could very easily do for server two and server four is set up a MAC address and say, right, server two, you're in this interface. This is your MAC address. This is your VLAN. That can never be forgotten because it's set up statically. So if we do this for server two and server four, no matter how full the CAM table gets, 
these entries were there first, so they can't be forgotten, and the private conversation between server two and server four will remain private. And if we want to get rid of it, we just put a no in front of it. 99% of every single command you're going to learn about Cisco switches and routers, if you want to get rid of it, or you don't like it, you put exactly the same command in there with a no in front. Something else we can do to help limit that CAM address starvation or filling up the CAM table is port security. Port security is one of my favorite setups. So let's go into interface two and we're now in interface mode and the command is switch port port security. Now here's a little trick for you. The command switch port is a layer two command. So every single command that comes after the word switch port is going to affect layer two functionality. So just tore that in the back of your mind. So switch port port security, we've got aging, we've got Mac address, we have maximum, we have violation, and we have CR. Now CR stands for carriage return. This basically means just press enter. So this is because Cisco iOS was built in the late seventies. The enter key was called carriage return. So wherever you see less than CR greater than just means enter. It just means that switch port, port security, that is a valid command. You just press enter and you're good to go. Now, the reason why I'm stressing on this so much is because you can spend half an hour saying switch port, port security, aging, switch port, port security, Mac address, switch port, maximum, whatever, switch port, port security, violation, and have all perfect commands. But if you forget to just type switch port, port security, and then press enter, None of those commands do anything. You have to enable switch port security with the switch port port security command. Then you have to set up the parameters that you want to make unique. So switch port port security, enter. Then switch port port security and then the other commands that you're interested in. Something interesting about switch port port security, which is really, really awesome, is that when it detects shenanigans and it detects something bad and says, right, I need to stop you doing this, it basically shuts down the interface by default and sets it into this state called error disable. Error disable will stay like that in error disable mode forever. So here's two commands that are not in the material. Error disable recovery interval 600. Error disable recovery cause security violation. What this means is that error disable recovery interval 600. In 10 minutes, I'm going to automatically attempt to try and recover from an, the error disable state. Error disable recovery cause security violation means that I'm going to try and recover from an interface that's been put into error disable by a security violation. Without these two commands, your interface will go into error disable and it will stay there forever. The only way to do it is to log in, go to that interface, type shutdown, and then type no shutdown. Now, if you're in a small office with maybe 30 people, maybe that's good. Maybe that's what you want. You want to find every single port that's gone into violation and manually fix it because you don't know what's happened. If you work for a company that's got a thousand switch ports and a thousand computers, that's a lot of work. So you might want to set up something automatic to recover so that you don't have to spend all day, every day, re-enabling ports. Because all of this stuff is logged and we'll just run Splunk reports. So new command for today, switch port host. This is a lovely little shortcut that Cisco have given us. That's two commands for the price of one. It's actually three commands, but in this level, We'll just say it's two commands. Switch port mode access and spanning tree port fast. We're going to spend a bit of time on spanning tree later on. And there's also other videos I've done on spanning tree. So we're not going to touch that today. So we've gone into our interface. Notice here, or new command maybe for you for today as well. Interface range. Fast Ethernet 10 to 19. Let's not type these same commands 10 times. Let's type them once and have them program on 10 interfaces simultaneously. Notice too that we have turned on port security because you've got to turn on port security with the first command once and then go on to the others. 
Switchboard port security maximum one. Switchboard port security violation shutdown. The switchboard port security maximum one means learn one MAC address. As soon as you see a second MAC address hit this interface, shut down. That's what this command means. Now, these two commands are the default. So if you type switchboard port security, enter. Switchboard port security maximum one, switchboard port security violation shutdown, enter, and then do a show run, you're not going to see these two lines because they are the default. You're only going to see these two lines if you change the values away from their defaults. Now, there is another violation state here, switch port port security violation protect. Now, this is pretty cool because this doesn't shut down the port. This says the first MAC address that comes along, learn that one, use it, good to go. If a second MAC address comes along, just ignore it, forget it, chuck it in the bin. Only allow the first MAC address to work. There's another one also, switch port, port security violation, restrict. So protect and restrict are identical except for one tiny thing, which we'll look at in a minute. Now the other one, the last one is also one of my favorites, switch port, port security, MAC address, sticky. This is awesome because switch port, port security, MAC address, sticky physically adds the learnt MAC address to the running config. So for me in a classroom environment, I go and set up the switch, I turn, I set up the switch for port security MAC address sticky, I turn on all the computers in the room. Then I go back to the switch and I do a show run and I notice that it's now learnt all 20 MAC addresses are in the running config for each port. So I save the config, I turn all the computers off, good to go. Now those MAC addresses are there forever because they're saved. They're in the running config and I've saved them to the startup config. So if anyone tries to move computers around or plug a different thing in, it's never going to work because we're physically locked down and I can see in the running config all the MAC addresses. Here are the three violation states, shutdown, protect, and restrict. The biggest difference between protect and restrict is that syslog messages. So if you just set up protect, you'll never know about it. You set up restrict, and every time a, a MAC address comes along that's been chucked in the bin and completely ignored, we are going to send messages to our syslog server. So it's very, very easy to run a report on our Splunk, 7 a.m., all right, Splunk, show me the last 24 hours, how many switch port, port security violation restrict messages have you seen and where? And you get a nice little report. Very, very useful. Just a bit of a caveat though here, switch for port security, it will not work. It will not even allow you to configure unless you've physically forced the interface into access mode. IP telephony is a funny thing because here we've got a one switch port with a phone and a PC. So you might think to yourself, well, Josh, that's only two devices. That should just be two MAC addresses. That is true, but as the phone powers on, it wakes up on the access VLAN and it sends out a broadcast and says, help me, I'm a phone. Can you please tell me how to be a phone? And then the switch answers and says, hey, Mr. Phone, how are you going? You're a phone. You should be on VLAN 50 because that's where phones live. So the phone says, thank you so much. I'm now, from now on, I'm only going to talk on VLAN 50 as myself as a phone. So now the switch has actually got two MAC addresses. It's got the phone MAC address on VLAN 10 and the phone MAC address on VLAN 50. Then the PC wakes up, says, hello, I'm a PC. And the switch receives the MAC address from the PC. And that's its third MAC address. Eventually, the phone's first MAC address will age out. But for that first few minutes where everything's just waking up, the switch will learn three MAC addresses. Two, one MAC address in two places and the PC on its own VLAN. So that's why you should always set, whenever you're doing voice, always set it to three. Because I've seen people do this and they set it to two and the phone works and the PC doesn't work. And they go away and they scratch their head and they come back 10 minutes later and now the PC is working. Because the switch has forgotten about the original broadcast from the phone. 
And always also a good idea to have violation restrict. So that if the PC um, turns himself off and plugs his laptop in, then it's not going to shut down the port. Because if that port goes into shutdown, the phone turns off. So you don't want the phone turning off if someone takes PC5 away and plugs in a different PC. You want the phone to keep working. And we set a bit of a timer there to say if you've gone away for more than two minutes, then we'll, um, we'll forget about you and we'll, we'll take it easy. So this is a really good example of setting up port security with IP telephony at the same time. VLAN hopping attacks can happen when a user plugs themselves into a port on a switch, but that switch is allowed to be turned into a trunk. So they can enable software on their device to say, hey, this is now a trunk port. And once that port comes up as a trunk, all VLANs are available because the tagging can be done and you can just tag that traffic with any VLAN you like and you get full access to the entire network. Simple way to mitigate this, force all ports to access mode. This way, when you fire up your laptop and you say, hey, I'd like to become a trunk, the port will say, no, your access mode, and if you're going to try and tag anything, those tags are going to be completely ignored. Double tagging, though, is another problem where a PC, so PC1 is on VLAN 10. They're on the same VLAN as the native VLAN. So they insert a tag to say, hey, I'm on VLAN 10. But they insert a second tag to say, I'm on VLAN 20. So that frame goes into the switch. And inside the guts of the switch, it says that frame needs to go across the trunk. It's already got a tag, VLAN 10. Because the VLAN 10 is the native on the trunk, the switch removes VLAN 10 tag from that frame, but leaves behind the double added bogus VLAN 20 tag. So as that frame moves along that trunk to the second switch, the second switch receives it and says, oh, you're on VLAN 20. So I will now forward that traffic on VLAN 20. Once again, this only happens when you allow frames that, to be tagged as they enter into the switch. Force all ports to access mode. Don't use the native VLAN for anything. Do not have any hosts on that native VLAN. Now, we don't spend a lot of time using private VLANs, but I just want to expose you to this concept just so you know what it's about. This is one switch. One switch with five connections, four PCs and the router to the internet. Oh, notice here on the right, we've got two PCs, that are plugged into the same switch on the same VLAN, VLAN 100, and yet they are unable to talk to each other. But they can get onto the internet. The easiest way to think about this would be, let's say, you're in a hotel, and you've got 20 rooms in your hotel, so you give every port in a hotel a port on your switch. They're all on the same VLAN. But you set up the switch in such a way that none of those ports are allowed to talk to each other. So someone in room four can't attack someone in room eight. The only thing they can do is get to the default gateway. DHCP. DHCP is a wonderful thing. PC wakes up and says, oh, I need an IP address. Please help me. The server says, sure, here's an offer that I have an IP address that I've got that I think you should use. And then the client says, thank you. I'd love to request using that address. And then the server acknowledges and says, sure, I have now acknowledged that you're using that address, so I'm not going to give that IP address to anyone else. I mean, if you work in an office with only 20 computers, you could quite easily go around and set them all static. You work in an office with 20,000 computers, that's going to take a lot longer. But DHCP is fantastic, it's setting things up dynamically, and also you can also send out extra settings by DHCP as well. But unfortunately, there's no security for DHCP. So there are two very common attacks for DHCP that can really make yourself have a bad day. The first one is a rogue DHCP. So someone's in an office and they, they want to set up their laptop and their printer and their desktop all on the one connection. 
So they go down to Harvey Norman and they explain what's going on and the buffoon at Harvey Norman sells them a home router instead of a little switch. So they bring that into the office and they plug it in, bang. There's another DHCP server on your network because that's what our home routers do. So now other legitimate users in your network, when they want to do DHCP, instead of going to the real DHCP server, they go to your bogus home router DHCP server. So rogue DHCP servers, um, always bad news. The second type of attack is a starvation attack. And that's where you run up a little piece of software on your client that says, please, Mr. DHCP server, can I have 100,000 IP addresses? So it just constantly sends DHCP discoveries and requests, all with different MAC addresses. So the DHCP server is obliged to allocate IP addresses to all of those 100,000 requests, and it just runs out of addresses. Both of these style attacks, very easy to mitigate. DHCP snooping. So we set up a trust relationship that says the server, we are going to trust the server sending server type DHCP messages into switch one on port one and into switch two on port one. So when PC one says, hey, everybody, look at me, I'm a DHCP server. And he starts sending out DHCP server messages into port two. The switch says, no, you are not a DHCP server. Any DHCP server type messages are going to be chucked in the rubbish bin. The second command, if you look in the bottom left hand corner, IP DHCP limit rate five. So when that PC, it says, all right, fine, I won't be a DHCP server. I'm going to starve you out. I'm going to send a hundred million DHCP requests. Well, that command says, no, you're going to send five. So the first five get through and then number six, all the way up to hundred million get chucked in the bin. So this PC one attacker, not only can he no longer be a server because his port's not trusted, but he cannot starve out the DHCP server by just constantly asking for new IP addresses. ARP spoofing or poisoning. Now you guys actually do this in uh, one of your other labs or you've already done it in one of your other units. VU21989, I think it is. You actually do a proper man in the middle attack using ARP poisoning. So PCA and R1 are quite happily talking to each other and everything's fine. But then the attacker comes along. And when PCA says, hey, Mr. Router, I want to talk to you. The attacker says, use this MAC address. When R1 says, hey, PCA, I'd like to talk to you, the attacker chimes in. He says, use this MAC address. So now PCA and, PC and R1 are now going through the attacker. Classic man in the middle attack. So PCA goes to the attacker, then to the R1, then R1 goes to the attacker, then PCA. So this is just classic ARP poisoning. So we can mitigate that using dynamic ARP inspection. Now, so it's turn on DHCP snooping and we turn on dynamic ARP inspection. So the switch and R1 trust each other. So when this R1 says, hey, everybody, look at me. I'm who I say I am. The switch says, yeah, right. I trust you soon that. When the attacker says, hey, look at me. I'm the default gateway. The switch says, no, you're not. I've already got an entry. I've already got in my ARP table R1's MAC address and IP address. So you can't say that you're the R1's IP address. I'm not going to trust you. So it's just now setting up. So now the attacker cannot do a man in the middle of attack using ARP. MAC address spoofing is something similar as well. So in this example, we're setting up the switch to verify. So we've got a server using MAC address AABBCC and its IP address is 192.168.10.10. And we've got Mr. Naughty Person, whose IP address is 192.168.10.11. So when Mr. Naughty Person says, no, 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 I'm MAC address AABBCC, the switch says, well, no, I'm going to actually check that. I'm going to ask you, hey, what's your MAC address, buddy? And when he comes back and says, oh, it's not AABBCC, well, then he says, no, well, I'm not going to allow that MAC address on port two. 
because I've already verified that MAC address AABBCC is on port one. So if someone on port two says, I'm PC AABBCC, the switch is no, you're not. I'm verifying it, I've checked it, and you are not. Now, spanning tree is a wonderful protocol, and I'd have a whole other video on how awesome spanning tree is. The thing about spanning tree is it's a layer two loop mitigation protocol. At layer three, there's a, there's time to live. So there's an actual section in the header of layer three, keeping track of how many routers it's gone through. But there's no loop mitigation at layer two at all. So one tiny broadcast at layer two can completely cripple your entire network. So that's what spanning tree was to invented for. Spanning tree is a protocol where switches talk to other switches and they say, hey, I've got these connections and you've got those connections. The thing with spanning tree is you must always elect the boss. So the, so you, the switches talk to each other and say, this is how I can get to the boss. This is how you can get to the boss. They keep track of all their interfaces and they know when a loop is happening. So spanning tree is a layer two loop mitigation protocol. So there's a whole bunch of terminology we need to think about. So we need to elect the boss. The boss of the network is called the root bridge. The root bridge is the boss of the network, typically the strongest, fastest switch or right near the middle of your network. All ports that face towards the root bridge are called root ports. All ports that face away from the root bridge are called designated ports. So we've got a nice little triangle here. We've got a nice little loop at layer two. So somewhere, someone has to make the decision to break this loop. So switch three has looked at the topology and says, well, I've got one way to get to the root and there's another way to get to the root, but I've done my math and my calculations. And if I shut down my port two, that is the worst, my port two is the worst path back to the root bridge. So I'm going to disable that port. And now the loop's gone. How does it make this decision? It uses BPDUs, Bridge Protocol Data Units. And these tiny little BPDUs are sent every two seconds. So every two seconds, the switches are informed and learn about what's going on in the network, what's the best path to the root bridge. There are timers involved. There's a blocking timer, a listening timer, and a learning timer. These timers are set up for safety so that even if a BPDU comes along to a blocking port and says, hey, the loop's gone, you need to go forwarding right now, the switch says, no, I'm just going to sit back and wait and make sure that this information is validated and verified because I don't want to cause another loop by unblocking a port. So it sits there for 20 seconds. So once 20 seconds have gone by and it hasn't been told anything different, then it transitions into a listening mode. And during the listening mode, it's listening for all PPDUs, learning, listening to the network, seeing how it's all going. Then 15 seconds after that, it begins learning MAC addresses, populating our CAM tables so it knows what to do with the user traffic. And then it finally starts forwarding. So if an interface is already blocking, it can take 50 seconds to begin to go forwarding. And when you physically plug in a cable, it still has to go through the listening and the learning phases. So it takes 30 seconds. But in most modern PCs and modern hardware, Windows has already booted up in like six seconds. So it just can't sit there for another 24 seconds waiting for the network to be ready. So there's this wonderful command called PortFast. And all PortFast does is it takes the listening and the learning timers and drop them to zero. So it still goes through the listening learning phases, but as soon as you plug in your, your cable, it goes listening learning forwarding. So you're ready to go straight away. Something else that can happen is that shenanigans can happen. So BPDUs are sent out every port of every switch. So let us look at ports 11, 18, and six on switch two. Those computers are configured those ports, sorry, are configured to set to computers only. So what would happen if I took out, unplugged PC1, unplugged PC2, 
and just plug the network cable from port 11 to port 18. It would put a loop in the network and the whole network would just die. So we are going to put a command on port 11, 18 and 6 that says, if you ever receive a BPDU, shut down immediately. So that's it. We've now protected our network because our trunk links are meant to have BPDUs and they're saying which ports to block and which ports to forward. And the access or the ports facing our clients, if someone accidentally plugs in a switch or tries to be shenanigans and put a loop in the network, the very instant that BPU is received, it will shut down that interface. Now, spanning tree's got no security. So it's very easy to do shenanigans with BPDU. So a naughty person could plug in a switch and say, hey, everybody, I'm the boss of the network. Send all traffic through me. And then they could set up span and they could start listening in on all of your network. So you've got to think about the fact that the root bridge is meant to be the middle of your network. So you don't want a person on the edge taking control of that. That would be really bad. So let's look at the last two things to mitigate against those spanning tree attacks. So port fast, make our PCs work quickly. BPDU guard, stop idiots plugging cables in where they shouldn't be plugged into and putting loops in our network. Talked about those. The last two are root guard and loop guard. So root guard just says, if someone on this interface claims to be the root, say no, that's bad shut down this link or take this, put this in inconsistent state because the root cannot be over there. The last one is loop guard. Now, when there's a loop in your network at layer two, the switches go 100% CPU because they are getting absolutely smashed. When they're super high CPU, they may not have the capability to create BPDUs. So when that happens is the bottom switch, the bottom left-hand corner switch, if it stops receiving BPDUs at all, after 50 seconds, it might just say, oh, well, I'm not being told to stay blocking, so I'll just start forwarding. And that could be even worse. So we're going to put a command on called loop guard. And loop guard quite simply means only do things when a BPDU tells you to do things. So BPDU says stay blocking, you stay blocking. BPDU say go forwarding, go forwarding. If you stop receiving BPDUs at all, stay blocking or go inconsistent because you cannot make up your mind unless you actually receive a BPDU. All right, let's summarize what we've looked at today. So MAC address flooding, filling up the CAM table. How do we fix it? Port security. VLAN attacks, VLAN hoppings. How do we fix it? Make sure the trunks are for trunks and any unused port, put them in, force them to be in access mode. Someone does, if you want people not to be able to talk to their neighbors, institute private VLANs. DHCP spoofing and starvation, use DHCP snooping. Spanning tree, set up your root guard and your loop guard. MAC address spoofing, use port security, use DHCP snooping. ARP poisoning, use dynamic ARP inspection and port security and DHCP snooping. So thanks for watching. Please remember to subscribe, click the notification bell. If you enjoyed this video, give me a thumbs up and leave me a comment with what you'd like me to make for my next video. I'll see you in the next one.